Hello and welcome to Nursing Pharmacology Diuretics. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk first about how water moves in the body. This is really important to be able to understand how diuretics are going to be working in the body. So if we take a look at these two pictures, the one on the left side is showing that we have an unequal amount of solute. In this case, it's going to be sodium. So when we're talking about diuretics, we're talking about sodium. So let's take a look at this in terms of sodium. If we were to have a small number of sodium on the left side, and we're in that left diagram still, and a large number of sodium. So you see all of those sodium molecules over there on the right side, and then there's just a few over on the left side. Water goes to where sodium is. So we would expect that water would move from the left side of the diagram to the right side of the diagram. And that's what's illustrated over here in the picture on the right, is that the water has moved over to the right side in order to dilute the sodium so that we have the same concentration on both sides of that membrane. So that red thing there in the middle is a membrane. In this case, it's a semi-permeable membrane that is allowing water to pass through and to go over to the side with a higher sodium concentration. This is how your diuretics work. This is how fluid volume moves within the body is because we have a higher concentration of sodium in one space than we do in another space. How it changes in the body as an overall global kind of phenomena is that we have the kidney filtering sodium and water. So kind of on a high level here, the picture on the left is showing the blood is coming into the kidney with waste products, and then it gets filtered and then the blood is going back out without waste and the waste products are going out in the urine. Now, if we were to blow up one little nephron in that kidney, keeping in mind there's millions of nephrons in the kidney, but we have one little nephron over here on the right Right, that we've blown up. Now you can see that the functional area of the kidney, that is the glomerulus, is going to be pictured there, that round looking thing. And then we have the blood coming in with the waste, going through the glomerulus, and then it gets filtered back around through our tubules and into the collecting duct, and then our waste products go out in the urine. The blood then, after being filtered, goes back to the body through the vein without waste. Now, if we look at the other side, the yellow side of the diagram there, we will see that we have the filtrate coming out of the glomerulus, and it's going into the ascending duct, and then down into the loop of Henle, and then into the collecting duct, and finally out as urine. So let's take a look at each one of these sections and talk about what's happening here. So in the glomerulus, we have some initial filtration that's occurring of the plasma, including sodium. Sodium is also being filtered out. But we're doing a lot of the filtering here of waste products out of the kidney. Now, unfortunately, sodium is going to follow a lot of those waste products out, and so we lose a lot of sodium here. Remember, water is going to follow the sodium, so we have a lot of sodium, a lot of water that has been filtered out through the glomerulus. And we need to reabsorb some of that water. We can't just be dumping all that water out. So the next step in the process here is we have the proximal tubule in which we have some initial reabsorption of sodium occurring there. Next we have some additional filtration of sodium and water that's occurring in the loop of Henle. And you can see how vascular those areas are. So those vessels are reabsorbing the sodium and in some cases water so that we can maintain our fluid balance in the body. Then we have our sodium being reabsorbed in the collecting duct, in the proximal part of the collecting duct, and we're exchanging it for potassium. So this is the area where we can run into trouble. If we are dumping too much potassium in order to reabsorb sodium, we're going to end up with a low potassium level. Lastly, we have our excess water. So now we get down to the distal part of the collecting tubule, and we're finding out that, oh, geez, there's still too much water in here, so we're going to reabsorb more water. Now, these components are important because they represent areas that our diuretics can work on in order to help the patient to be able to lose excess water. So let's talk about those different diuretic types, the first of which is called a thiazide diuretic then a loop diuretic, and then finally a potassium-sparing diuretic. Thiazide diuretics block 
sodium reabsorption in the distal tubule. So there we're at that distal part of the tubule before we're hitting the collecting duct, and that's where we're working when we're talking about these thiazide diuretics. Keep in mind that we're going to have loss of some sodium, loss of potassium that is occurring there with our thiazide diuretic. Here's some examples of thiazide diuretics. Hydrochlorothiazide is a very common one that is an initial medication used to help control fluid volume in our patients who have heart failure and other cardiac conditions that require a diuretic. The next type is called a loop diuretic, and as the name implies, okay, we're talking about the loop of Henle, and it's blocking the sodium reabsorption in the loop of Henle. Now remember, if we keep the sodium in the urine, then it's going to draw more fluid into the urine, and we're going to dump more fluid. This can lead to more concentrated filtrate and water excretion. So the filtrate that's going back as far as our, our vascular system goes is going to be more concentrated, so uh, water is going to be drawn in. This can lead to sodium, potassium, and calcium loss. So our patients who are on loop diuretics, we have to be careful about watching their potassium, watching their calcium, because we're going to tend to lose more of those electrolytes with a loop diuretic. Here's some examples of loop diuretics. One of the very common ones is furosemide, which we use commonly in our patients who need a diuretic. Potassium sparing diuretics. These diuretics work over here in the collecting duct. They're blocking sodium and potassium exchange in the collecting duct, and this will lead to a higher concentration of sodium in the filtrate, which then causes more water to follow, and the patient will have diuresis. It can lead to high levels of potassium, though, if it's used in combination with ARBs, those are angiotensin receptor blockers, and ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. So those medications, it doesn't have to be all three. It can raise the combination of potassium when used in combination with any one of those three medications. Some examples of potassium sparing diuretics are listed here. Spirolactone is a common one that we use. In fact, in some situations, it's been found that spirolactone leads to better fluid and water retention or fluid and water balance in our elderly patients and also helps to prevent falls rather than using a loop diuretic or a thiazide diuretic. So some general considerations with your patients who are on diuretics. Diuretics work by manipulating osmosis in the kidney. They work by blocking that movement of sodium and water in the normal way that the kidney would work. Now, in some cases, our kidneys aren't working the way that they should and hanging on to more water than they should be, and that could be an issue for our patient as well. So we may be manipulating the osmosis back to a more normal method rather than abnormal. Sodium is excreted, water follows, so we can end up having some problems with potassium and calcium as well. Can cause renal injury if it's used in combination with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So just be careful with your patients who are on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We want to be watching about their diuretics. Diuretics tend to cause the patient to have a lower circulating volume. NSAIDs tend to cause some vascular constriction in the kidney, which can also lead to a lower circulating volume in the kidney. And that, in combination, could lead to not enough volume in the kidney to be able to perfuse the kidney itself. And then we could end up having some ischemia and necrosis to the kidney and acute renal injury. So just be careful with NSAIDs, low dose for as short a period of time as possible. That is always our choice with NSAIDs rather than long-term high dose NSAIDs, especially in your patients who are using diuretics. Nurses can assess for fluid volume by looking for edema, hypertension, hypotension, dehydration. Those are some things we ought to be assessing for. And correlating those back to the diuretic use. Also, be checking those electrolytes because remember, we can have problems with our sodium, our potassium, and even our calcium with using diuretics. If you'd like to learn more about how to manage nursing emergencies in your patient, check out our Nursing Emergencies program. Decreasing complications by using preventative strategies, rapidly detecting problems, implementing prompt action. That's what the Nursing Emergencies Program is all about. To find out more, see it online at thenursingprof.com. Thank you for joining me for Nursing Pharmacology Diuretics. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.